All right, if we could turn, please, to the book of Esther and the fifth chapter, Esther chapter five. And we're going to look at Haman's big day. And for him, it was almost a perfect day. Um, so we're going to consider that together. Beginning in verse one, we're going to read the entire chapter, just 14 verses. So it says, now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther, the queen, did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word. So it's kind of uh, looking uh, together in a day in the life of the prime minister. And as we said, it's it's a big day for him. It's, a, it's almost a perfect day, uh, except there's a little fly in the ointment, a Jew that is spoiling everything. Also, it's interesting that we're going to see in this chapter that this evil man gathers enough rope to hang himself, as the saying goes. And I want to just look at Psalm 7 just for a moment, just to see uh, what is really going on here, that God, in a sense, is preparing this evil man for a great downfall. And so it says in uh, Psalm 7, verse 14, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and have brought forth falsehood, he made a pit and digged it, and is fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. And that's exactly what is going to happen to Haman. And again, I want to just, uh, as I was considering and meditating on this just a few minutes ago, what struck me was this day is going to be, in a sense, the best day of his life, spoiled a little bit by this Jew, but overall, it's going to be the best day of his life. And I was thinking that uh, the unsaved 
the best day of their lives is the best day they can have on earth. But if they don't know Christ, they have an eternity of misery awaiting them. And for us, in a sense, uh, it's only going to get better and better and better. Uh, we just have so much to look forward to, but we also should spare a thought for lost people that, that you know, in their glory days, it's the best they will ever enjoy. And certainly this is the case for this man. Notice verse one, then it says it came to pass on the third day. So the days of fasting uh, were drawing to a close. If you remember in chapter four, verse 16, uh, one of the conditions Esther had given uh, for her willingness to go into the presence of the king unbidden was that the people would fast. And notice verse 16 specifically, it says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Now, I want to just point something out. I think we've used this before in a different context, but I want to just say that when the Jews talk about three days and three nights, part of a day is considered to be an entire day. So, for instance, remember uh, the Lord Jesus, it, it talked about uh, as Jonah was in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And yet we know that the Lord was not three 24-hour days in the tomb. And yet he likened that to his resurrection. And that is because in Jewish thinking, part of a day includes the whole day. Because it tells us here in chapter 5, verse 1, it came to pass on the third day, not the fourth day. Remember, she asked them to pray three days and three nights. And if it was three 24-hour days, she would have gone in on the fourth day. But she goes in on the third day. And just as the Lord Jesus rose again on the third day. So I think this is very supportive of the view. Uh, again, I would say of a Friday crucifixion. <laughs> uh, I believe that with all my heart, that he was crucified on Friday, that he rose again on the first day of the week on Sunday. And it still fits in with the three days, three nights because of the way Jews account that. And so it says she went in on the third day. That Esther put on, and again, notice the emphasis on royalty now. She put on her royal apparel stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, even over against the gate of the house. And somehow the writer wants us to see this is all very much tied with the, the whole royalty thing. She's, she's preparing to go into the king, and how does she prepare to go into the king? Well, she puts on her royal apparel, because this man, Ahasuerus, was not only her husband, but also her sovereign, and she must be suitably attired as she goes in to the presence of her sovereign. And so she gets dressed in her royal attire. She would appear before him as a queen, entirely in queenly attire. She had not been, as we know, in the king's company for some 30 days, and it's Easy for her to imagine, uh, to, easy to imagine her mingled feelings. Would he reject her bold approach? Is he going to put out the scepter or not? Uh, it was a tense moment. Would, would she be rejected or would he be favorable towards her? It was doubtless in the providence of God that she did indeed obtain favor in his sight. And it wasn't because of her beauty or because of her royal dress. It was, again, the sovereignty of God that caused the king to put out the scepter to allow her entrance into his presence. And again, I want to just kind of show some contrasts here. The contrast is, is stark with her first encounter with Ahasuerus. The first time, if you remember, she had spent a whole year in beautification treatments. <laughs> Remember, she, she, she had a whole year of, of, of uh, being in this spa, perpetual spa for a whole year, getting ready. Every possible action was taken to make her as attractive as she could be. On this occasion, she goes into the presence of the king, and she's not eaten 
for three days, perhaps feeling faint. Uh, you know, I don't know what it's like, but uh, I suspect that uh, three days without food, uh, you're feeling a little bit weak, exhausted from it. And so there she is, uh, no longer the, the great prep preparations and treatments, but she's been fasting. Previously, she was brought passively before the king, accepting the role to which she had been cast. In this time, she initiates the encounter, hoping to change not only her fate, but the fate of her people. And as we, I think, alluded to last time, she's really, at this moment, potentially under a double death sentence. The one decreed by Haman, signed by her husband because of her ethnicity, because she's a Jew. And also now a second potential death threat because she's approaching the king without permission. And it's good to be reminded that we too were once under this double death threat. We were already spiritually dead, separated from God because of our genetics, because of our ancestry. We were already spiritually dead, but also we were in danger of a second death, eternal separation from God. But thanks be to God that the Lord Jesus, by dying in our place and in our stead, has, as it were, allowed the divine scepter to come out so that we can not only escape the certainty of eternal death, but we can actually boldly come into his presence and enjoy his presence. And so what a blessed people we really are. Also, by way of contrast, there's a strong contrast between the episode in the story of Vashti in chapter one. Both queens violated the law, but the circumstances are, are oddly inverted. Vashti risked her life. How? By refusing to come before the king when she was summoned. Esther now risks her life by coming before the king without being summoned. Esther now risks her life by doing this. Vashti's failure to appear incited the king's wrath. Esther's unexpected appearance, as we're going to see, elicits the divine fa or his favor. Vashti's insubordinate will resulted in an attempt to put all women in their place, whereas Esther's insubordination, if successful, would result in the deliverance of all the Jews. So it's just interesting to put these two uh, ladies and their situation in contrast. So verse two, it says, and so it was, and it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Approach in to the king, not only was the life of Esther at stake, but the, as we've said, the survival of her people was also involved in this. The sight of the, the queen seeking audience with him must have startled him, made him conscious that something special must have been pressing her to act in this way. And that's why he puts this question to her. What is your request? That's why he asks her, what's, what's going on? What's the reason for, for this intrusion? Why are you risking your life for this purpose? It's interesting that oftentimes the things that we dread the most never happen. And you could imagine her anxiety. Is he going to not put forth the scepter? Am I going to die? And it didn't occur at all. And so often we think, you know, if I do this, is this going to happen? And we have all these, these fears uh, that are really not based on fact, but we, we get kind of all bound up in our fears and the things we fear often never happen to us. And certainly in her case, that was not the case. All her fears were unfounded. She got her welcome before the king. And again, we've said it's not just a, a response to her beauty, but the overruling of the master's hand. And again, we might consider 
uh, as we think about this, the book of Proverbs and chapter 21 and verse 1, just to see the sovereignty of God even in the heart of kings. And Proverbs 21 and verse 1 says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. And so we see something of divine sovereignty at work here in the king putting out the scepter to allow Esther to come in, even though she's intruding, she's breaking the law, everything she's doing is not correct, and yet she's allowed to go in. Notice that the king not only allowed her to come in, he in verse 3 it says, Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to half the kingdom. Now, this was most likely an exaggerated statement, but it certainly shows something of the king's favorable attitude towards her. What is your request even to half the kingdom? He, he held out the golden scepter of which Esther had spoken to Mordecai of in chapter 4, verse 11, uh, when he mentioned that uh, somebody would be put to death except such a one whom the king would hold out the golden scepter to. This golden scepter was a long, slender wand or rod with an ornamental knob at its end. And he reached it out to her, and Esther drew near and touched it in acknowledgement of his kindness and as a mark of her subjection to the king. Now, we said that this statement of the king, what is your request even to half of the kingdom? It's not to be taken literally. It was a proverbial expression denoting great liberality that was often used amongst ancient kings. A, grand, a, grandiose, a grandiose compliment gesture not intended to be taken seriously. And we, we have another example of it. And whether Herod was influenced by this account uh, in the book of Esther, we, we can't be sure. But in Mark 6, when uh, the uh, Herodias had danced before him, uh, we notice in Mark's gospel, chapter 6, verse 23, he swear unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And so certainly it's an expression of oriental generosity. What would you like even to have my kingdom? Uh, you can imagine if she have said, okay, I'll have half your kingdom. I suspect that he would have said, <laughs> that's not quite what I meant, uh, but what, what do you want? And I can try and help you with it. So <clears throat> Esther, uh, in response, she invites the king to a banquet. Uh, so notice verse eight, Esther answered, if it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. So she invites the king and Haman to a banquet. And Haman, a bit like Judas in the upper room, is, is about to have his last happy meal. Uh, Esther will, will not make her request immediately. In fact, Haman will leave the banquet feeling at the pinnacle of his power and be thrilled with himself. The king, of course, is still bewildered by the whole thing and by the request for a second banquet. Uh, and uh, maybe that will be the cause of some of his insomnia in the next chapter. The other thing just to observe, and I, I think it's very important to see this, that in this book, there are many things that are done in haste. Uh, in fact, we'll see verse 5. Then the king said, cause Haman to make haste. But the one thing that's not been done hastily is the request of Esther. She comes, she asks for a banquet, and she doesn't do anything that night except serve the banquet. And then she asks for a second banquet. Now, you, we'll think about why of all, all this uh, in a moment. But but the, the one thing we see is that this is the only really non, 
uh, hasty thing that is taking place. Everything else seems to be done in tremendous haste. And let me just uh, show that to you, just to, to remind us in the book how everything was done that way. So chapter two, um, in verse nine, uh, and Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women. No, that must be the wrong verse. Let me see, is it verse No, that's the wrong one. Chapter 3, verse 15. Oh, I'm sorry, 2, verse 9. I was looking at chapter 1, verse 9. That's why it didn't make sense. 2, verse 9, it says, And the maiden pleased him, so he obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her the things for purification with such things as belonged to her. So again, the Haggai gives her things speedily. So again, there's an expression of haste. Chapter 3, verse 15 Again, the post went out being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace. So again, the, the decree to, to kill the Jews was given in haste. Chapter 5, verse 5. Again, we've already looked at that. The king said, cause Haman to make haste. Chapter 6, verse 12. Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered chapter 6 verse 14 and while they were yet talking with him came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared and then a last one in chapter 8 and verse 14 so the post that rode upon mules and camels went out being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment so lots of things done in haste and yet the one thing that you would think might be done in haste, and that would be Esther getting this request out to the king uh, for her people, uh, she tarries over it and takes two nights to do what we would think would be done very quickly, especially when the king asks her, what's going on? What is your request? So you might ask the question, why did she invite Haman? to this banquet what was behind this invitation three reasons have been suggested firstly she rightly assumed that the inclusion of the king's favorite would doubtless please the king and he was the king's favorite remember whatever the king uh, whatever haman asked the king would give him his ring and say go ahead no problem. He had complete confidence in Haman, and so he was the king's favorite. Secondly, it would also disarm Haman and make him feel that she was favorably disposed towards him. So there'll be no suspicion on his part. Uh, even the queen loves me. Everybody loves me, that, except Mordecai. That's what he would think. And third, she would eventually have the opportunity of unmasking the wickedness of Haman in the king's very presence, giving him no time to prepare any excuses. But she's patient, waiting until the first banquet had passed successfully. Then her plan would be advanced. So she risked her life to invite the king to dinner. Our king, on the other hand, laid down his life so we might be with him forever and enjoy an eternal banquet in his presence. Remember Revelation 19 and verse 9, where we read of our invitation. <clears throat> Revelation 19, verse 9, it says, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. They saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And again, I think the, the wonder of it all that we are going to be there as the bride even, and it, it seems so incredible. And that's why he says, uh, <laughs> these are the true sayings of God. This is really true. It, it, it almost seems so fantastic that one day we are going to be there in his presence as his bride at this incredible feast. And yet, he said, these are the true sayings of God. This is 
this is so this is true god who cannot lie is saying this is our destiny this is our future so verse five it says then the king said cause haman to make haste that he might do as esther hath said so the king and haman came to the banquet that esther had prepared and you can imagine again haman's excitement he is invited to a, a private banquet with the queen and the king and uh, it, again it's a high point of his life this is the zenith of his career uh, he's got this personal invitation uh, and uh, again it, it would be it would be it would be staggering i mean just imagine that that this week i get a letter in the mail from uh, king charles and and the queen consort uh, camilla asking me to to join them for a meal i mean that would can be pretty you know, you'd be shocked wouldn't you, you say wow that's amazing and so he really feels like he's he's flying i mean you can't get better than this this is a position that he sees himself in so but the king is suspicious that there's something more going on the king said to esther verse six at the banquet of wine and of course we just recognize that these persian feasts incorporated considerable amounts of wine uh, we, we saw that early on in chapter one and verse eight where it says and the drinking was according to the law none did compel for so the king had appointed all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure and so often these uh, these banquets were uh, flowing with wine there was plenty in fact the actual word banquet is derived from a verb meaning to drink and so uh, the, there's a there's a kind of a, a lavish lifestyle connected with the persians and so she's providing this this uh, banquet of wine but the, the again the the feeling is uh, uh, from the king that she's not telling the whole story here and and so notice he says what is thy petition it, it has to be more than you just want me and Haman for a banquet and it shall be granted thee now, what is thy request even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed deep down he knows she has got something more to ask and so he's asking what what is it and of course we know that she is going to intercede for her people and I just want to uh, kind of pause for a moment here. I want you just to go with me at, at Isaiah chapter 59, just for a second. Isaiah 59 and verse 16. Isaiah 59, verse 16. It says this, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. Here's Esther, and she's willing to act as an intercessor for her people who are destined to death. And it is interesting that one of the things that God wonders at is, why are there not more intercessors? Why are there not people who will pray faithfully for a lost world under the sentence of death why are there not people who pray for a church that's desperately in need of revival god wonders at this he marvels why is it that there isn't this uh, well esther uh, is willing to take that place to intercede for her people but she's she's not ready yet to do this she's um, again exercising tremendous patience uh, in doing this and so the king knows he had not boldly been approached and summoned uh, w without being summoned risking her life just to invite him to a banquet what is thy petitioner and again he repeats this and so this dinner is only a preliminary to her real request and so she answers in verse seven then answered esther and said my petition and my request is if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. 
So she answers slowly and deliber deliberately. And she says, my petition and my request, I will tell you tomorrow the, the full extent of it. But she wants to invite them to another banquet the next night. Now, again, she's deferring, making known this decision, perhaps partly still increasing the affection of her husband towards her, partly maybe to highlight and get, cause him to expect something of significance and importance that he's going to ask. But most importantly, we, we, we have to see in this the providence of God, because during that extra day, something else is going to take place. Uh, we, we're going to see here, this is Haman's big day. Tomorrow, or next Friday on our part, will be Mordecai's big day. <laughs> and it will be the low point, in a sense, of Haman's experience. And so the delay providentially allowed for the king's sleepless night and the events that followed. So again, providence is definitely involved in all of this delay. And again, it's it's the timing of God in all of this is seen here. So in verse eight, she she again asks for this second banquet. And again, um, there's an interesting aspect of God's sovereignty that is also seen here. And that is that it, it's now known, uh, at least to her attendants in the court, that she was a Jewess. Uh, if you remember when Mordecai uh, had told uh, the uh, trusted Chamberlain uh, that the decree was against the Jewish people and um, that he had, he had let it out of the bag that uh, she was Jewish. In verse 8 of chapter 4, at the end it says, to make supplication unto him, to make request before him for her people. So the cat is out of the bag, in a sense, in the in the general attendance of Esther. It's known now that she's Jewish. And yet the interesting thing is that Haman, who's the prime minister, this information has not been given to him. Even, even though it's known to other people, and you see in courts, there's lots of intrigue and People look for opportunities for advancement. And surely a word in Haman's ear to say that uh, I've got some information that you might find very interesting, that Esther is actually a Jew. But that had never been done. And so, uh, again, we can only see God's restraining hand that no, none of these power-hungry uh, people in the court looking for advancement, none of them had had taken the opportunity of, as it were, spilling the beans and telling the information. So we see here that in the case of uh, Haman, he has absolutely no suspicion whatsoever about Esther's ethnicity. He doesn't understand, doesn't know that at all. Uh, in fact, he's just delighted that he's been invited to two banquets now. And so, uh, again, we can see the hand of God here in all of this. Now notice in verse 9, we said this is all about Haman's best day. It says, then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. And so again, he's he's delighted. He's just thrilled. I mean, how it didn't get any better than this. And yet, isn't it interesting how easily his joy is spoiled? Notice he says, uh, again, verse verse nine, Haman went forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. I mean, already this man is decreed to death. But why is it so disturbing? And notice, too, that Mordecai continually refuses to bow. The decree does not change Mordecai's behavior or alter his way of acting. Just like Daniel. Do you remember when the king had signed a decree? 
uh, that any petition made to anyone except the king. Uh, and what does Daniel do? Well, he carried on doing what he always did. He prayed three times with his window open. Remember that? Yeah, he doesn't, the decree doesn't change his acting or his conviction. It would seem, though, that one thing Mordecai had heard, that somehow Esther had been favorably, favorably received. Now, how do we know that? Well, notice where he is. Then went Haman forth that day, joyful with a glad heart, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate. Remember, he couldn't come in the king's gate in sackcloth and ashes. That wasn't allowed. So obviously, he is somehow word has got to him that the scepter was out, that Esther was received, and he has removed his sackcloth, and he has now uh, once again returned to the king's gate. So Mordecai, he doesn't even rise in the presence of Haman. He showed no sign of fear before him, despite the death decree against the Jewish people. One thing is interesting, too. You can, you can get a measure of someone's character by the size of things that upset them. What does it take to irritate you? For him, even though he's just had the best day of his life, in a sense, just seeing a Jew that won't bow to him just spoils everything. Just a little thing irritates him. We're the bride of Christ. We're welcome into the presence of the king. Anytime we want, the scepter is always out. We can draw near as often as we want. Why then are we so quickly and easily bugged? Maybe because someone doesn't acknowledge us. Or when we experience something that doesn't quite go our way, isn't it amazing with all the privileges and blessings we have, how little things can bring us down and irritate us so much? <laughs> in a sense, we're, we're, we're no different to Haman in many ways. Little things. It, what is it? The little foxes that spoil the vines. And it's the little irritations of life that rob us of the, the full enjoyment of all the blessings that we have in the Lord Jesus. Verse 10, nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. He knows that he's got this death uh, sentence already. But I want us to notice, too, just, just something to observe. In the next three verses, in verses um, 10 through 12, I want, you, I want you to notice the masculine personal pronouns here. And, and you see a man who is totally stuck on himself. Sometimes I think if you just pay attention to pronouns, it's very, very insightful. So let me just read verse 10 down to verse 12 and emphasize the, these personal masculine pronouns. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, yea, as to the queen did let me let no man come into the king unto the banquet that she had prepared, but myself, and tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. And so what do we see here? We see a man who is stuck on I, me, my, and myself. <laughs> he is totally besotted with self. It's all about him. Everything resolves, revolves around him. And don't you get a little bit of a parallel here with uh, uh, the parable of the rich fool that the Lord Jesus told in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. And do you remember this man was confident how he was set for life? Uh, he's building bigger and bigger bonds and, and all of the things, and, and he's, he's just, he's, everything's together. Uh, and, and yet, Although he's so confident he's set for life, in reality, 
He's just a few hours away from death. And you see exactly the same scenario with Haman here. It, it almost seems like it doesn't get better than this. Everything's going well for him. Uh, he, he's, he's got the glory of his riches, the multitude of his children, uh, and, and uh, uh, he, he's been promoted to second only to the king. He's been advanced above the princes and servants of the king. He's got everything going for him. And yet this very man is just ours just hours away from death. Two other men come to mind like this, whose false confidence led to their death. King Belshazzar, remember, he's got this great feast uh, during which he blasphemes the God of Israel by, uh, and, uh, and yet the handwriting was on the wall and God announced his doom. And that very night, Babylon was conquered and he was slain. And yet again, he's, in a very boastful position. And then, of course, Judas, the very apostle of the Lord. At the upper room, he was in the very place of honor. He was the one who was given the sop. That was given to the guest of honor. He was in the, the highest place amongst the 12. And they're all been bickering about who's the greatest. And he's in that position. And yet, just hours away from his demise. And so here is a man who is totally vain, totally consumed with himself. He's bragging to his wife and friends about his wealth, about his sons, about his status in the kingdom. It was considered a great blessing among Persians and Semitic peoples to have many sons. And this man had 10 sons. I mean, he's, he's really got it together, it seems. And he says in verse 12, moreover, he says, even the very queen, let no man come into the king, unto the banquet, except myself, and I'm invited again tomorrow. So again, his boasting, in a sense, only accentuates his latter humiliation. Proverbs 16 and verse 18 says this. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And this man is just completely consumed with pride. And again, who is he like and who's behind this? I was doing a study with a young man last night on the fall of Lucifer. And we were looking at Ezekiel 28 and we were looking at Isaiah chapter 14 and thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Uh, you have said in your heart, I will be like the most high God. And we see there's, we are never more like Satan when we're filled with pride. We are never more resemble the, the evil one when we're consumed with pride. Uh, it's the most satanic sin to be lifted up with pride. And yet he says in verse 13, yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Even though I'm second in command, even though I'm invited to banquets with the queen and the king, I can enjoy my riches and my power because Mordecai will not bow to me. Isn't that amazing? Malice is so deep-seated, a so deep-seated hatred that it brings delight if our enemy suffers and pain if our enemy succeeds. Malice can never forgive. It must always take revenge. Malice has a good memory for hurts and a bad memory for kindness. And this man, he cannot bear the sight of this man who refuses to bow to him. And so despite everything else he's got, the very sight of this man is sufficient to ruin everything. And so in verse 14, a suggestion is put to him. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him. 
So here's a wife giving advice. <laughs> and it seems on the face of it to be good advice, but it turns out to be very devastating advice. She says, and the friends join in, let a gallows be made of 50 cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Of course, a man with Haman's authority, all he has to do is ask the king, and the king will rub a stamp it. Remember, we've seen that. He's already asked for a, uh, the genocide of an entire group of people. And the king, without batting an eyelid, gives him his signet ring and says, go ahead, you do it. And so with, with that kind of authority, uh, they're suggesting to him, just, you know, you don't even have to wait 12 months. Go and get the gallows built and let's take care of this so that you can enjoy the banquet. Of course, this is all before the king discovered that Mordecai was the very man that had saved his life. That's why the delay is going to learn that. It's amazing the exaggerated size of these gallows. 50 cubits, that's 75 feet or 25 meters high. That's enormous. Why would he want to do that? Well, he wants to make a great spectacle, a great public spectacle of this Jew for refusing to bow. And so it'll kind of burn into people's consciousness. You cross me, this is what's going to happen to you. And so, of course, uh, with his kind of power, he can get things done. And so he goes ahead. And so he says... Uh, uh, the, the thing pleased him, and, and he caused the gallows to be made. Now, this is nighttime. This is after a nighttime banquet, but he just has to click his fingers, and the, the workers are there, and the banquet uh, or, or the, the gallows is made. His wife's suggestion delighted him, and he had the gallows built, confident that the king would approve his request, and that by this time tomorrow, he would enjoy a really happy meal with his enemy put to death. Matthew Henry, the great uh, commentator, has a lovely application to all of this. He says, Esther came to a proud, imperious man. We come to the God of love and grace. She was not called. We are. The spirit says, come. And the bride says, come. She had a law against her. We have a promise, many a promise, in favor of us. Ask, and it shall be given you. She had no friend to introduce her or intercede for her, while on the contrary, he that was then the king's favorite was her enemy. But we have an advocate with the father in whom he is well pleased. And the application is this. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace. Brethren, we have every encouragement to avail at the throne of grace. <laughs> let, us, let us use this privilege. Let us go and ask. Let us intercede for a people under the sentence of death. Let us come frequently. Let us come boldly. Let us come joyfully into his presence and ask and it shall be given to you seek and you will find knock and it shall be opened unto you brethren let us avail of these things and let us remember that our unsaved friends the best day they'll ever have will be contrasted with an eternity of eternal misery and we need to be those that are concerned about them. Haman had his best day. Yes, it was a little bit tarnished, but it was a big day for him, almost a perfect day. But where's Haman now? What is Naaman experiencing now? It's not the pleasantries that he experienced that day. Let's ever be mindful of the urgency of our message. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.